start, you guys, if everyone's ready. Last few people coming in. Um, there are extra chairs if anyone wants extra chairs. Okay, well, I'm Susan Cochran, for those of you who have not been to one of these programs before. And um, we're restarting uh, with this presentation. We're restarting our Wabanaki Voices speaker series again for the summer. It's going to be thinned down. We're only going to have four, four events this summer. Um, but this has been a collaboration uh, between History House, primarily Patricia Harain and me, um, with Darren Ranko and John Bear Mitchell. And we have planned these programs for years, but COVID kind of put the kibosh on it for a couple of years. And uh, we started it in all seriousness last summer. And um, uh, John Bear and Darren have just been uh, extraordinary partners. And they, the four of us, got together and planned all sorts of different programs, mainly speaker programs, but also some programs at the History House itself. And um, one of them included uh, Barry helping some high school students build a wigwam, which is in need of a little repair right now, but it's going to happen. <laughs> and, um, and so that was, has been one of the programs that Barry's been involved with. But another one of the programs that has come up that has been, been supported by both History House and by the Davis Foundation grants um, was a, a mural project for past, present, and future uh, depictions of Wabanaki history and culture. And because of, uh, for lots of reasons, this is probably going to be the sum total of that mural project, which is going to be great. Um, but Barry, is, uh, Barry was born and raised on Indian Island, for those of you who don't know him. And uh, he's a real jack of all trades. And he's a painter, a birch bark canoe maker, a runner, a canoe racer, a dog sled racer, an, uh, an educator, and former chief of the Penobscot Nation. He graduated from UMO with a forestry degree, but then took, uh, went on to get an education degree. And then he spent the next four years on Indian Island um, teaching students in the elementary school uh, through a course that focused on um, uh, kind of strengthening the connection between nature and culture for those mm -hmm. children. And that evolved into a, uh, what he's calling a uh, school visit program, am I right, Barry? Mm -hmm. um, that takes him all over the state uh, to share his culture and traditions with non-native children, and he's still very involved in that. Um, <laughs> He, uh, he also, you know, through the love and respect that he and all Penobscots feel for the Penobscot River, he, as chief in particular, he got very involved with fighting the toxic waste dumping in the Penobscot River, and I'm sure was somewhat involved in the freeing of the, of the river itself from the dams. Um, he also initiated a, the 100-mile native spiritual journey by canoe and foot from Indian Island to Katahdin quite a while back. And now, how many years has that been happening now, Barry? 41. 41 months, yeah. So <laughs> these, are, these are things that he's done for a long time that a lot of people aren't quite aware of. Um, but basically, he's dedicated his whole life to preserving Wabanaki culture and language. Uh, with the youth of Indian Island and with his school visits, his basket making, his canoe building, and obviously his painting. And so he's here to talk to you about this painting and the process of this painting. Come on up, Barry. Do you have the uh, thing on me, John? Did you? Okay, good. All right, well, thank you, and thank you all for showing up. Uh, quite a nice turnout. Uh, it's been, it, it's really, a, I hate to overuse the word honor because a lot of people love it now. Oh, it's an honor to have breakfast, <laughs> you know? So anyway, I, I, I try not to overuse it, but what, when you're asked to do things like this, when you're asked to come into a school and talk to kids, uh, it, can't, it should never be anything less than an honor. And then to be asked back, okay, so <laughs> it works. Um, and that's what I have to do in the morning. 
So this session, if, if we could leave it exactly to 8 o'clock, then I can get home and I can get the rest. And then I can give the kids my full attention tomorrow. Because as, as I age, I, I start to uh, wonder about my energy too. So I was asked to talk about the process. And I think I'll start by saying Susan wanted a sketch ahead of time. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't think so. <laughs> but she insisted. So I said, no. <laughs> and she said, but. And I said, I understand why you want a sketch. It's, it's, only, it's only right that you're going to be paying money for a project. You'd like to kind of know what it's going to look like. So I didn't do anything. I wouldn't work on it because I'm not motivated to work on something that has some conflict in it. So finally, I told her, I said, and I actually think David told her. Oh, that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> Lord, Lord uh, told me first. OK. <laughs> so you can see our interactions. Uh, I finally told her, I said, I, I think I know why I'm, I'm, I'm not willing to do a sketch for us. It's because when I do the etchings on baskets, I don't do a sketch. That basket tells me what it needs to have. I know that sounds like really out there, but if, if it works to convince you, then I'll use it. <laughs> All right? So I just don't have a pre-made thought in my head before I etch a basket. Once the basket is made, then you kind of take a, a little um, look at it, and then you start thinking, what is the message I want to tell? Do I want this basket to tell a message? If it's, if, if it's a kick butt etched bat, I mean, um, winter bark basket, it has to tell a message. I'm not going to just do a simple little thing. It's going to be kick butt. And, and that's how I started seeing this. This is a big project. It's two-dimensional versus the basket, which is three. But still, um, they have similarities in that, how am I going to design, how am I going to compose it? I didn't know. So my cousin, James, I, I lean on sometimes. I said, so I got this project, and I'm kind of got an uh, artistic block with it. Because you know, they want the Wabanaki view of what life was before white people showed up. He said, we're all about location. And what are we? We're river people. That was all I needed. I said, I got it. Thanks. <laughs> but not only are we river people, but we're, we're the entire landscape the entire landscape. And a river is nothing without its mountains, which is nothing without its streams and ponds, its animals, and its beginnings. So we're going to go back to the beginning here. And that would be the Ice Age. So that's all I had. I had none of this in my head. I'll start with that. So I'll start with Katahdin. And then, oh, by the way, I'm going to get to a point where I'm not going to talk anymore. I would much prefer answering your questions. But if I just throw this out now, I'll give you enough to chew on. And, and if you don't have any questions, then, then we go home. <laughs> but the idea was, what was our life like here? And so as I got into it, oh, I started seeing a ton of things. Probably 10 times more images didn't make the canvas that I wanted on there. And then you think about how much they're paying me. I'm thinking, no, no they're not getting all that. <laughs> they'll, get, they'll get this amount. <laughs> but it doesn't matter if, you're, if you take on a project four foot by six foot. That's what matters. Every inch of that has to have uh, an impact on the viewer, an impact on the message, every square inch. Even if, even at, like the bow here, right? If you just looked at that, it would be very plain. But it's not that big of a place. So in these areas, there had to be something. My problem was, how does it relate to what's next to it? It's a mural, so it's almost like you have no rules. You can do anything you wanted. But I wasn't comfortable with that. It had to make sense to in and itself. So that everything had to be related. So um, you're looking at my view of what my ancestors' life was like pre-contact. Fishing. Fishing is number one. I always ask the kids, what do you think the number one food for Native people was? Deer. I said, no, we didn't even have deer here. 
Well, um, they don't know. Nobody knows how to think. They know, they, they know how to listen, but they're not thinkers. If we're thinking about food, and you've got 11 species of fish coming up to this area, what are you going to eat? And how long does it take to get that to your plate? In what form? You just catch it and eat it, call it good? Or do you have to catch it for every day for like 12 hours a day, cleaning it, drying it, putting it away for the full year? Think about that. If you think about what you need to live, such as food, number one, fire, shelter, all that stuff, and, and then lay that out into the landscape, your lifestyle is getting food. And this is not about survival. People think, oh, natives survived. No, it's about thriving. You're living in an environment where the carrying capacity could feed millions of people, pre-dams, pre-roads, pre-sewage, pre all the things that ruin the environment that we're living with today. This is pre all of that. This is pristine. So you're going to be living a healthy lifestyle. So you're working hard to get your food, but your food is feeding you. It gives you the calories you need. Now, running is a big deal with, with uh, my people. But I, that was one of the things I had to kind of let go. I didn't want to, I didn't want to stress over things to you know, make it work in this thing. These things kind of came out and you know, I, I went with these. So we got corn, we got the food, we got the petroglyphs down here. W what does this message say? Ancestors. Ancestors, there you go, very good. And then um, the, the river system isn't just Katahdin and, and it brings in it, the Moosehead region. So that's sort of like my depiction of, you know, we got Kineo, but then the water comes down into here. This is actually the falls pre-dam. So I was thinking if I ever did, if I was to do the contemporary one, this would be gone and you'd have a dam. And then if I did the future one, there would be no dam. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so it's kind of self-explanatory. Everything there is pretty much food. Food and, and relationship. And processing. I mean, a, uh, gather, uh, not gathering, but what do you, you're going to get your food. You're, you know, harvesting. Okay, thank you. And th this here is a huge success, right? Bringing back the sturgeon upriver. So I think we ought to, you know, know, think about the things that we don't have today that was taken for granted then. When I taught culture at the school uh, and I was being evaluated by the BIA, they said, do you, do you think the kids take this program for granted? Because I had them doing all kinds of things. I said, I hope so. I hope they take it for granted. Why wouldn't you take food for granted? It's, by, it's plentiful. It's everywhere. This is something we're bringing back, is uh, wild ricing. Uh, the log drives took out a lot of the, the rice beds here on the river. But you know, we've got to have the economy. Economy over nature every time. If you want to be a real human being today, it has to be economy over everything all the time. So that's kind of like a nice thing about this. I get to go back in time. I get to you know, dream about the way it used to be to the extent that I think I know. I didn't live it, so I don't know for 100% sure. No one does. I get a kick out of people who write about native history. They don't know their you know what from you know what. They read something that someone else wrote who didn't know either. <laughs> you have native people doing the same thing, writing and not knowing. Surmising what they think they know based on what they could have known. <laughs> but I go out and build a birch bark canoe and I build a wigwam and I go, aha, you put that wigwam in that canoe and go down to the ocean for the summer and leave your gardens alone. Go ahead. All of a sudden they're like, oh shit, I already wrote it. It's already published. What do I do now? Rewrite another one. Okay, so you can see it. I wish we had better lighting on it because it, yeah. it really does come out when, when there's light on it. Yeah. <clears throat> I actually worked on it 
in a dim light setting so that when there's light on it, it just pops out. And I noticed that at the, at the History House. It looked really good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, with that, I'll take questions. You raise your hand like kids do. <laughs> oh, you don't have to. You can yell, yell out too. With your culture, I see the eagle, I see the wolf, and the moose. Where does that fall into your whole culture thing? Well, the eagle's not food. We don't eat eagles, right? But we hold them in high esteem, much like we would the hummingbird. So if I was really playing with your brains, I'd have had the hummingbird higher than the eagle. Because really? our legends talk about the, hum um, yeah, the hummingbird going higher than the eagle. So all of a sudden, the eagle isn't such a big deal anymore, right? <laughs> they can't go as high as the hummingbird. Or we have stories about the loon, or what goes the deepest, you know? But um, no, I wanted to put the eagle there because everybody recognizes the eagle's connection to native people. So let's, let's start with the stereotyping, get us all on the same page, and then I'll, and then I'll take you back to pre-Europeans, our connection to our food and our relatives' food. And the Europeans killed off the caribou, shot the last one in 19... Bragged about how they could shoot them and they just wouldn't go away, so they shot all of them. And then you have no more caribou, you have no more relationship with the wolf. And we have all this in our language. What's the uh, circle in the tributary up there on the right corner? That was my attempt to fill a space. It's like I was all I was all done, and then I had this spot, and I'm like, not good. Laurie says, put a fishware in. I said, okay. So that's a fishware. Just nobody in it. They're done for the day. <laughs> they spent their eight hours out there catching fish. Now, I did the stereotypical fish beer guy with the fish beer not in the water, just so you can see the points. But that's not how you use it. It has to be in the water. Who knows why? Re refraction. Very good. Just as good as the fifth graders did. <laughs> Yes. Some of us here are docents of the Kobe Museum of Art, and I want to verify some things that, you know, to make sure. Um, did the peoples move up and down the river? Because I thought the whole, whole point when you made the um, the wigwam at Kobe, that the point was that you could take it apart and move it. So, was it moved, or did you, or were these more permanent settlements, or how does that work? Okay, so here's one wigwam. It's not perfect to scale, right? Because we're, you're way back there. Here's one canoe. Yeah. Put that in that. No, you have to take it all apart. So, you, so you're saying these Take it ones. apart and then put that in that. But even so. It so doesn't fit in my truck. So we don't have this. I had to make three trips in my truck. We don't have this migration like we've been told because you're saying that's fake history that these people made up. I want to get this straight. I don't want to, you know, I'm not trying to be funny. I want to make it get it straight. I don't want to tell kids wrong things. White people get stuck on the word migration. I want to know why. Did we migrate here? Of course we did. From the south. That's why the glacier is here. Glacier receded north. As soon as it did, we moved in. Father Rawl wrote that we rolled up our wigwams and put them in our canoes and went to the ocean for the summer. Now, if you didn't live the lifestyle, that would, you wouldn't question it. But I questioned it. I question everything, especially when white people write it. <laughs> and they're sending those letters back to France or back to England or back to Spain. And what are they saying? They're making up lies. So migration is out. We've been here for 13,000 years. There's nothing to migrate to. If there's caribou over here versus over here, we'll go to them. But that's not migration. That's going hunting, mm -hmm. right? If we're a little tired of these fish and we want shellfish, you know how long it takes to paddle from here to the ocean? If, if you're your age, <laughs> two days. 
Or if you're, if you're not, or even if you are your age, even my age now, it's, it's a day and a half paddle if you just want to take your time. Or if you're, you just want to get down there, you're going out with the tide. You're, you're on the coast in four hours from here, right here. All right, so there's no, there's no, and you got your gardens, 250 acres of garden. You leave them, who's going to tend them? Every animal that knows how to eat. Yeah. Right, okay, so you start piecing this together and you realize what Father Rall wrote had political agenda in it. I don't know why, um, but... It, it makes no sense for you packing up a village of 850 people-ish and going to the ocean. Now, did we go up and down the river? Absolutely. All, you know, you could, like I just said, one day's journey. We have a picture at Penobscot, probably 1940-something, I'm going to guess. Black and white photo of two gentlemen in a birch bark canoe going to Massachusetts to ratify treaties we made down there with, the, with the, I think, the colonists. But their journey was uh, down the Penobscot, through all the portages, a little bit in the ocean, and the next thing you know, they're in, they're in Boston. And then they come back. So they talk about their journey. So we have that really strong tradition of paddling up and down the rivers, but it has to make sense to your lifestyle. So if you're living strictly in this area, you're void of certain foods, then it makes sense to go to the ocean. But would everybody go to the ocean? See, that's what I picture about migration. That's like everybody following the caribou. Would that have made sense at one time? Yes, in this time period. When the, when the land was rebounding, it would have made sense before all the rivers were formed to have had this lifestyle and following the caribou. But woodland caribou doesn't migrate 1,000 miles. It sort of stays in the same place. So, like I said, I, I didn't live in that time period. I can only put the pieces together based on um, intuition and how I, how I live my lifestyle. So would you say, like, where all the, for example, that huge bunch of shell middens down in Cushing, so there were probably people who just lived there year-round, just so yes. you lived here year-round. Exactly, yep. And, and traveling back and forth as needed if wanted, mm -hmm. but not because it was an annual migration. And there was some sort of mutual trade often. Now, see, you jump into conclusions, <laughs> no. right? No, I don't you don't have to trade. Should... You don't have to trade. You go down and get it. All right, so I like to tell this story. Laurie and I and a friend, Steve Kayad, was commissioned to build a traditional birch bark wigwam. I'd never done one. Laurie had never done one, and Steve sort of had done something. So between the three of us, we said, we can do this. They gave us the blueprints. Okay, archaeologists said, here is the wigwam. You, you noticed that, didn't you? <laughs> you caught that real quick. I wasn't questioning it. We're going to go to the Abbey Museum. You're not going to question them. They're all experts. And they got archaeologists. So the poles went like this. They even had the number of poles. They had the angle. And we got to work. We got going to work. We had the poles. We started sewing the panels. We're putting them on. It's looking pretty good. Got a row around, second row. And they were doing tours. The tour guide brought in a group of people and said, Oh, and we have a project going on where we're making a traditional birch bark wigwam. And it was like I got kicked in the head by a mule, literally. Because part of the diagram showed a fire pit on the inside, basically the width of the wigwam. <laughs> so I'm going off, oh, Christ sakes. <laughs> what would it have been? And, the, and they were up and down the coast, and they were up and down the rivers. Say again? A smokehouse? Yeah. yeah. That makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so that's how we regain uh, traditional knowledge that suffered 400 years of genocide. 
you're not going to do well if you're trying to exist like Ishi. You ever see that story? Out in the woods and you're all by yourself. You need community. You need people. We had to, we had to accept colonization just to survive. So away goes this lifestyle. Away goes the storytelling from generation to generation about how we got the seals, about how we harpooned whale, porpoise. That, that lifestyle was totally gone as I was growing up. So then you get to start um, do, bringing back the language. So my great uncle worked with a linguist, self-taught linguist, who was a medical doctor, who gave up his life as a medical doctor and, and focused on li linguistics and creating a writing system for the Penobscots. And my, my great uncle was the only person that would work with him because the doctor was such a pain in the you-know-what. And so was my great uncle. He didn't take any you-know-what from anybody. So anyway, they got along good. And uh, Frank paid my uncle money to work on this project. And they got so much of the language written down over 40 years, probably all of it. So you go back to those notes and you see the language where we hunted porpoise. And I'm going, wow, we hunted porpoise. We hunted seal. And then you realize, of course we hunted seal. Because you'd see old photos where somebody was working on seal hides. And I, I thought at one time they were deer hides. No, they were seal. So anyway, for the understanding of culture, we can have a stereotypical view. But even that has elements of truth and elements of could be's and maybes, even, even, even from my experience. But what we see here is stuff that I do, <laughs> so I know this is okay. Yeah? Were there more than one um, communities like that along the river? A lot about the, Kinetic, the Kennebec I don't know, but I grew up in the Penobscot. And in, again, back to the language, Fires from the mouth all the way up. So fires, obviously, that's people. So I can only imagine for the Kennebec the same thing. Because if you look at the land, this land, the Kennebec area, holds what we needed for our gardens. So if there, you know, you could drive along today, you see a, you see a huge garden, I mean a corn patch, because it's cattle corn. It's flat, you know. So yeah, I, I think I think I think I think <laughs> that the Kennebec, like the Penobscot, was just from one end to the other. Because it, the, again, if we go back to the thought of carrying capacity, now that doesn't just make it an absolute truth, right? But we have to draw our conclusions somehow from something. So a fellow who wrote the book, uh, Notes on a Broken Fluid, I think it was, Kerry. I like, I like the way he looked at carrying capacity. What could this river provide for how many people? So now again, go back to the fish alone, let alone everything else we can do. That would, me, that would feed millions of people. So it is noted that there were millions of native people in what's now called New England. Not a, not a little band here or a little band there. Could that have been the case back in the tundra area? I don't know, maybe. Um, back to language, how accurate are a lot of the words like Skowhegan, Norwich, or you know, some of the river names, and, and how accurate would you guess they are? Well, um, I'm not fluent, and if I was fluent, I could tell you in a heartbeat. So I have to go on fraction, you know, information. Um, Skowhegan, like anything else, it's based on some element of truth. All right, so it's pretty close. Scoutahegan. Scoutahegan. Yeah. Would that be? Would that be it? Um, Scoutahegonal. All right. So. In your dictionary, it is spelled out very close. Mm -hmm. You know how you would say Scoutahegan. I'm sure it was. But the meaning is not, not. A little bit. Yeah. Just not much though. Right. So the Scoutahegan one's not bad. It's not Scoutahegan. It's scout Scoutahegan, which means trout. A apparatus by which we catch trout. That's 
Not whatever that guy wrote, looks far or whatever it was. I had a conversation with that guy, and he would not listen. It's like, dude, you're wrong, <laughs> okay? I know a little bit of the language. Now, Norridgewalk, we don't have ours in our language. So it's not Norridgewalk, it's Nulidgewalk. I like it when I actually know something that they're asking. Because <laughs> again, I'm not fluent, but I have learned, I've heard a lot. Yep. Speaking to Kineo and its importance. Yeah. It's important. <laughs> <laughs> because it's rock. Yeah. And the rock was brought down with the glacier. And then the glacier leaves, and it leaves us all these wonderful gifts, right? So you could just pick up this rock from Kineo anywhere and, and make, make your tools from it. And what's really neat is Laurie's family owns land. Um, I'll use these colonized terms. Um, on the Kennebec, and we have a site there, and we have found Kinew fell site that um, were blanks where you can see where um, pieces were taken off for knives or arrowheads or whatever they needed at the time. Yeah, so, you know, we're talking about a tool, and tools are very important in every facet. That's how you make the canoe, is by shaving the wood. And we didn't lay claim to it like an ownership. It's obviously in our area, so it would be respected by all visiting tribes who would come down to gather that rock. We wouldn't say, you know, you've got to pay a fee or, you know. You could ask permission, no. <laughs> they come in respectfully and take what they need and go home. Where'd the corn come from? That's a good question, right? So if you read somebody's corn book, they all have the answer. <laughs> read 10 books, they got 10 different answers, right? Is, was it here, right? Was it here and who was here with it? Now, if you talk to the state of Maine, they'll tell you White people brought it up from along the coast. Well, gee, we don't have our corn mother story in English. Sorry. <laughs> it's in our traditional language. So it's here. We've been here 13,000 years. I don't have a date on that story. Yeah. Nobody has a date on that story. Who created that story on what date? If we did, Maybe we'd know a little better how we got corn, squash, and beans here. The fact is they're here, we're here, and did we trade for them over the, over the thousands of years? Was it 6,000 years? This is probably a good question to ask our, our archaeologists. We have a Penobscot Nation archaeologist. We actually have two of them, and one is so high up now in the archaeology world, we don't see her anymore. But uh, Chris Sokolexis is dynamite for two reasons. Now he's, he's, he's an archaeologist. But like me, he's asking uh, through a native perspective, how, why, what would have made sense? So I can't give you how long corn has been here, other than it's in our language. From way back. And the pure language, pre-European, right? Mm -hmm. So. We don't know why the state archaeologists, what the agenda what there is. is. The what, is your, what is the word? You didn't raise your hand. <laughs> you can do it. No, I, I know you the word. I know the word. What is it? Skamun. What is it? I said it once. Be nice. Skamun. Yeah, so you got to listen hard. Could you speak to the state of affairs between the subgroups in the Wabanaki Federation? Uh, the other tribes across the country are in constant warfare. There are raids from the Mohawk tribes on to into the Wabanaki region at some point. I like the word constant. It, it sounded. You, you think I'm going to let you get away with the word constant? <laughs> Between the Western tribes, they're intermittent. Then. Nobody ever really talked about tribal warfare between the tribes until Mel Gibson's movie came out. <laughs> I wonder why that is. For us, that's, you know, I can only speak to our, our scenario with Wabanaki. You'd be a fool to pick a fight with a Mi'kmaq. So it didn't happen. 
If they wanted corn, you give it to them. So yeah. All right? Because they, they had their own lifestyle. The Mohawks, when you have two territories inter interlapping, you're going to get conflict because you got human beings. Enough said there, right? Yeah. But were they warfare? Were they constant conflicts? No. It makes no sense to be at war with the people because you're, you're busy doing what you got to do here. So we made peace treaties with the Mohawk, and we've kept them ever since, except for a canoe race we got in 10 years ago. <laughs> I read there was something like um, parties bringing back, uh, bringing back members to replace all the deaths that came from the plague. That There's no way you could replace the deaths from the plague. No. There's no way. Eight out of 10 people die. Uh, who wrote that? Oh, there's signs all over Castine. <laughs> what? Really? Yeah. Some historian. Yeah. Yeah. There was a there was a fella who, I think, spoke in at uh, New Lidjewalk, I'll say, um, and he wrote a book, and he introduced himself to me, and I, I I'm not going to say his name because I can't remember his name, but. He was very belligerent in everything that he wrote in his book that was very contrary to anything that made sense to me. So it, 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 further, it further validated my really dislike for people who write things when they think it sounds what, like what the reader wants to hear. So I just, and, and it's been that way since time began here. Father Rawl living with Abenaki for 30 years still got things wrong. Now were they wrong? Or was he lying for a reason? I don't know. But to say that we t took Native people to replace our dead, um, th there's nothing in my experience at being Penobscot that that would make sense at. They were called mourning, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, graves on, on these casting signs. Mm -hmm. News to me. <laughs> yeah. Now, like I said, though, we had some conflicts. Could that have been some of the reasoning put in there by the French and the English? You know, could, by whoever wrote that, could be. We, but when you have a conflict, there's the element of truth. Yeah, we did. But we, ha we also have wampum belts that prove that we've been at peace with each other forever. So. My first question is, are the Sturgeon and the canoe to scale to each other? <laughs> if you want them to be. <laughs> I would love them to be. But because it's the only question was, especially if they were to scale, uh, I'm interested in what the rest of that event was. OK, so if, if the, the scale, the, the canvas is six feet long. How did that play out? The, the sturgeon could have been twice the length of this canvas. Yeah. He's up close. I could have made him much bigger. But he's big enough. All right, because a lot of sturgeon aren't 15 feet. They're four feet, three feet. Um, so what's playing out is this is a harpoon. All right, now he's got a big job ahead of him if he gets one of these. But since they're not 15 feet, he's probably going to be able to reel that in on his own. If they were 15 feet and they were fishing out in deeper water, you, I would have had to put another paddler in here. Somebody do the harpoon and someone to do the paddling while he's hanging on for dear life. But so this is, this is sort of a, an idea of it. It's not the actual, it could, have been, it could have been better done. Laurie says, you forgot the paddle. I said, it's too late. It's, it's in here. It's tucked in. He's so good, he don't need a paddle. He steer it with his. He steers it with his weight. <laughs> yes. What's the technique for coming back up river if you've gone to the coast? Mm. Technique. Yes. It, the and tide you goes you paddle the other way. All, the, all the way, or do you pole? Or? You paddle where it's deeper, and then you pole up the rest of the way. And these rivers were not deep. Who owes us fifty dollars? <laughs> Yeah, the, the rivers, I, I, had to, I had to learn this myself because I grew up after the dam was built. So the, the river's deep, you know. You go up river a couple miles, 
you walk across. Oh, okay, I get it. Yeah. And when we do our, our paddle to Katahdin, we're above all the dams. Maybe not all of them. No, Rip Dam is up above, above us. But the section that we go up to Katahdin, that's probably this steep. That's the whole, as steep as it would be when you're above the Because it's far enough in between dams, I think it's the natural flow of the river. Yeah. So it would be that way all the way to the ocean, had those dams not I don't know. See, we've been cut off. Yeah. Yeah. But we took the dams out of the Penobscot, and to celebrate, we did a canoe race. And I did that canoe race. Yeah. So you got shallow water-ish at, at Old Town, VZ, Orno, and then as you get to Bangor, you got the tide. I imagine that's pretty deep there. And, and I think it probably came up further than that, and I think this tide would have come all the way to Skowhegan. Above Merriman Bay, really? I think so. Yeah, if, there, if there's nothing stopping it, then why wouldn't it? Now, as soon as they took that lower dam out, it's in Waterville, the, the tide. Because you got sturgeon in Waterville. So is there salt water in Waterville? And we have sturgeon in our, in our archaeological digs at Penobscot. And that's, that's quite a ways up. Either they could have gone down and got them and brought them home. I don't know. But they're, they're, they're located in our sites. Yeah. So they would have been located here, too. Because, like, Skowhegan is about the same distance upriver as where I grew up on at Penobscot to the, to the ocean. So polling. Yeah. I've actually raced people polling, and they were paddling and beat them. It is powerful. It's, it's good. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, 11 species come out of the uh, uh, ocean. I believe it's the spawn, yeah, and then they go back out. So we're busy spring, summer, and fall fishing, because now they all come down in the fall to go back out. Not all, but majority, yeah. Have you ever used the stone instruments, that, you know, maybe the stone axe or? I have, I've played around with it. Yeah, they, they work good. I've taken bark off a tree with a knife, a stone knife. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the, the beauty of it is you don't have to do anything. You know, like an arrowhead, yeah. no good. I can't do it. Chris can do it. But, I, you know, you just chip it, and you got, you got an instant knife. You could gut out a deer or anything you needed to do. Yeah. This focuses on the life around the water and the rivers, but what were the forests like at that time before, before the winter? Big. What role did they play in terms of what the plant got to do? If you go back to the stories, we're, we're, we are a running people. So we ran between our villages. And messages were delivered within two days covering 200 miles. We ran down caribou. You can't run down a deer today in, in these woods, right? You can barely move through these woods. And we all asked the same question, how the hell did the moose do it? <laughs> They're so big. We do not have a forest in, in this area that we had at one time. We had massive trees with nothing on the floor. You could drive a vehicle through there. So that, that helps me in thinking, running down a caribou, wow, seriously, how are you going to run down a deer? You, you can't do it. But in the old pre-contact, pre you would be able to. Um, it's a good question because I haven't thought a lot about it. We are river people, so going across land, uh, it would be like that. Let's let's go visit. Let's go visit our, our relatives at Penobscot if we're going to go from here to there. Same people, exact same people, Kennebec, Penobscot. Um, we like to divide them with names, but originally those names are only determining the same people living in a different location. So Abenaki, Penobscot, same people. Maliseet, Micmac, same people. Passamaquoddy, same people. Same, gene, same race, same genes, same everything. But we are in a different location, and we make our lifestyles there, so you, you generally uh, stay there. Now, one thing, another thing I liked about Kerry's book was he talked about the road systems in Maine today and how many of them 
are, are made on the trails of native people. And where Augusta was a major center, where all these trails came together. So I could, I could just picture, you know, has anybody hiked the Appalachian Trail? It is, it is the most ungodliest, treacherous, <laughs> horrendous trail anywhere because people wear these vibram sole boots. But if you're maintaining trails on, with moccasins, it's like running on a brand new Olympic track, you know? Anyway. So were there, were there any villages that were set up in, in, internally? You know, <coughs> I'm going to have to guess on that. I'm going to say the, the major villages were on the rivers. Again, it just makes sense. But that doesn't mean there weren't encampments inland on, on all, the, all the bodies of water, lakes and, and little streams here and there. We got, of course, this is way after contact. We got Birch Stream with all kinds of camps up and down it. But again, that's way after contact. So, um, so I don't think there would have been villages. Barry, can you talk, like, we talk about fishing, and I start thinking of, you know, growing corn, and it's spring, and summer, and fall, and those are really pleasant seasons to be in Maine, but what would it have been like for your culture in pre-contact in the winter months, when it's very cold and dark? Cold means you're not dressed enough, you're not moving enough, and you're not eating enough. It's not based on what the temperature is because that's our concept of it, right? We, we look at a thermometer and instantly we're cold, right? But I'm, gonna, I'm just guessing here, a um, little bias. I don't think we had a problem with the cold. Now, there are stories where we did, but I think those stories are sort of like, if you mess up, you're done, right? So we're not going to mess up. But here's the stories that says, well, get out of line, and you could die. So it's going to come get you. This, this thing is going to come and get you. It's like, oh, my God. So you don't want your little kids going down by the river alone, right? So you tell them these scary stories about the river monster. So you got snowshoeing. You got snow snake. You got hunting. Now, what I like to talk about is food all the time. We got our, we got our vegetables corn, beans, and squash. We got our fish. What else do we need? Ah, incomplete diet. We need red meat too. We need that protein, that red meat, only red meat, and the bone marrow, and the heart, and the liver, and the brains, and the fat provides. Fish is inadequate. So you have to have this complete um, diet. So there again, winter, hunting down the moose. Seals. Huh? Your seals. The seals that you would have harvested in the summer, perhaps, with the fat. Seals, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah you render the fat. Yeah. Yep, definitely. And, and bear, you render bear fat, yeah. porpoise fat, whale fat. Now, today I got a lesson. I wanted to know, did we harpoon whale? All right, I haven't seen that in our stories. A cousin tribe did it. That tells me we did it. They did it with a harpoon, we had harpoons. So that tells me we did. Yeah. And we do have stories about eating whale. But did that wash up on shore? You know, at that time I wasn't sure, but I, I'm pretty sure we did take whale. Our canoes, you will never ever, I don't care what, um, technology humans create, you can never outdo a birch bark canoe for buoyancy and stability in big water. Especially if you're really good. So their winter clothing would be like Eskimos? Eskimos? What's Eskimo? <laughs> Did he mean Inuit? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, similar. Yeah, I, th I think similar, but Woodland. See, they don't have the trees. But when did we have trees? Again, I got to ask Chris. When did we get our forest? Because before the forest, it would have been strictly tundra. And I bet at that point, yes, very much like the 
the Arctic, the Arctic people, which I, they do prefer Inuit or whatever they're. I don't know them all either. I just I'm always asking Laura because she has a lot of them on TikTok. <laughs> Speak to the other uh, native plants that you would have used for, for food. Food? Yes. Very few plants for food other than what we grew. Now you all know about fiddleheads. Yeah. I, I hesitate to call them a food. <laughs> Laurie loves them. I'm like, oh, I've had enough. Yeah. Right? So they're nutritionists. I don't think you can get more nutrition from out of any plant than, than fiddleheads. You look at their root system. They, they mean business. They are down, yeah. right? And they're pulling stuff that has not been, not been disturbed by man at all yeah. versus, you know, having to work the soil and deplete it, add back to it. Uh, fiddleheads are, are potent, potent um, for the body, but it's not a food staple. Fungi. Yeah, you, 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 it's a supplement to something that somebody might have needed for some specific thing. It's not a main staple. So I hesitate to call certain things foods. You know, we got a lot of plants that are great things, but they're not necessarily foods. Well, berries. I'm, that's where I'm wrong. Yeah. Very good, yes. You yes. Sugar from, you, know. uh, you don't get a lot of sugar from berries unless you process them. So, um, but some, yeah, definitely, and, um, and, ma and maple. And you can dry them. You can yeah. Dry yeah. yeah. Now, we didn't make maple syrup, even though Laurie and I make maple syrup, right? Because that's what people want. Okay. We, we took it further into the sugar process and, and, and hard rock candy. That way you can carry it. You don't add it to your food whenever you want to. We got five minutes. Yes. <laughs> When you're talking to your, the classes and so forth, how do you um, phrase it or how do you explain the white invasion? The, I, I check with the teachers ahead of time. Okay, so I'm not a third grade teacher. I'm not a fifth grade teacher. But I'm getting very familiar with fifth grade because I've been going to Brunswick every year now with the fifth grade. So I'm getting to the point where I'm getting more comfortable using words like invasion. They can handle it. So you want to know, like, like one teacher said, you don't want to send them home with nightmares, right? <laughs> so the Europeans came over, and we had a lot of conflicts. There were things that didn't go well for Native people, like their pigs and their cows invading our, our food stores for the winter. It's, it's, it's not good to do that. And they brought disease that we weren't used to, so a lot of, a lot of Native people died. And, you know, third grade and up can, can handle that. But I've always checked with the teacher because I don't want to overload them, you know. But they do have to know the truth. We can't just say, oh, the pilgrims and the Indians, they get along so good. And then all the Indians sort of just died. <laughs> well, they weren't here anyway, right? They just weren't here. That's what we were taught. There were only a few hundred. Don't you remember that? <laughs> <laughs> The pen is mightier than the sword. In other words, lying is mightier than telling the truth. See, I just figured that out. I want to thank you for that picture, for that. Um, it took time to be able to sit here through this last hour and see what you did in it. It's awesome. There'll probably be one or two things you'll see each time. That's right. You know, probably a couple views. And like, I tried taking a picture at home, and I didn't know where to start. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Little pieces hidden away. Hi, yep. I have a question. It has nothing to do, really, with that mural or the Penobscot. But it has to do with the Kennebec and Skowhegan. I grew up around the Penobscot, but I've lived around the Kennebec for over 30 years. And there is some controversy now in town because um, powers that be are planning this big water park. Mm -hmm for the Kennebec, and part of that is putting in this machinery that will create waves or whatever so that people can do their surfing and their whitewater rafting and have all this other minutia around. And to many of us, that's destroying the river. The river itself is magnificent as it is. And so I just wanted to know if you've heard about this and if you have an opinion on it or any advice. I'm not going to give an opinion 
other than maybe you can draw from my in inferences what my opinion might be. Mm -hmm. But look what your people did to the river already. You have dams blocking fish passage. Those initial dams starved native people. We were told that's why they made dams, was to starve us upriver, because we no longer had con control of our coast. We had to go inland. So how would we go about fighting something? That I'm not, that's, that's not my, my battle. I have a lot of my own battles. <laughs> that's going to be up to you. But I just want to frame it with some thought processing. You've already damaged the river. This is no longer. This is, this, this is a gift to creation, right? And it's got a cement dam on it. Now, we all know we all benefit from that dam. It should have had the proper fish passage. I would say I'm going to go all the way back to the original teachings when human beings first learned to hear, and that is do no harm to future generations. Now, you, if you're not going to harm future generations, you can't harm this one because it goes further. If you're not going to do any harm to the river, you shouldn't have made the dams. And if you're going to do the dams, you should have made it in such a way it didn't harm the fish. Case in point, go to Howland, Maine and see the bypass we built around the dam. It's beautiful. It works. If I would caution the people, if they're going to go ahead with this, and they got all the permits, they got everything they need, and you don't have any choice anymore, you ask them, can you do it in such a way that it doesn't harm anything? that nature created. If you're going to drill for oil, are you going to harm the, harm the planet? That's a pretty easy one. If you're going to put in some things for water, can you do it in such a way that it doesn't bother the fish? But are there any fish getting over that dam now as it is? No. That's pretty sad. I'd say take money and build a bypass around one of the dams. Let those fish get up river. And then if you can do that in conjunction with this water park, then it's a win-win. Is there anybody talking about that? I don't know. I don't live here. <laughs> I'm up river. And we're not reach those waves of conversation aren't reaching up where I'm at. I don't have a TV, so I don't if it's on TV, I don't get it. And if Laurie doesn't tell me what she learns, I don't learn anything. <laughs> Gary, I just had a question. How Last question, and then I got to go. I got to work in the morning. How far up did the tribes go from like this area? Everywhere. Everywhere. Yeah, yeah. You, there's no place in in what we know of the land base. We call it Turtle Island. You call it North America. There's no place where Native people have not been. We're, we're tied into that land still. 